And the first item on our, on our agenda is the approval of the minutes from last meeting. I move that the minutes be approved. Any discussions? <clears throat> Corrections? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, public comment. Do we have any public comment this morning? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next item, um, which is our third quarter electrical rate sufficiency study. City, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hope that each of you received this. Um, essentially, what we do every quarter um, and have done since December of 2012 is we take the annual rate sufficiency forecast that we prepare um, with our expenses, our anticipated revenues, and um, and our debt service, et cetera, and we update it um, in comparison to our actuals. So that's what you have through the third quarter, through actuals through the third quarter of June, um, including our actual build revenue revenue and the actual expenses for purchase power. What we're showing as um, of the end of the third quarter is that our current projected revenue surplus is right around our original forecast from last September. Um, we're looking at about 870 grand as opposed to 930,000, um, 932,000 in our original projection. Um, as we've talked about before, keep in mind that seems like a big number. It's right around 1% of the total revenue forecast, so it's a fairly tight margin, but one that we feel comfortable with at this point. And as a result, um, this tells us that we're on track and we're not recommending any adjustment to the rates at this time. Um, we would like to hold the rates the same through the end of the fourth quarter and then look at it again at that point in time. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions um, you might have um, regarding the, the forecast. One question, just the fuel down at the bottom of power purchase costs, the last line, mm -hmm. you got 49000 in April and 42000 for July. That's, is that so we can run ours? Um, uh, Tom is here and he can speak to that, but yes, those are fuel and oil costs for the city of Vero Beach itself. So, and they're kind of sprinkled throughout the year. I don't know that we've actually spent that much year to date. Um, I'd have to look at the quarterly report, okay. but I'm looking, I'm looking at Tom in case he's disagreeing with that. No, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions or, or issues? Mm -hmm. You know, essentially, I've got one. Purchase power costs seem to be holding steady then? Well, they seem to be, if you look, probably the best representation, I've included all the numbers for people who like that, but let's go to the graph at the um, at the very last page. And what you see is that our, um, our kilowatt hour sales forecast versus actuals and our build revenue forecast versus actuals are uh, rising and falling pretty accurately together. So in other words, our model's doing a pretty good job of projecting revenue based on sales, and our sales um, are... And our and our revenues are tracking along pretty well to our three-year average, which is what we use for the forecast. So you can see a few variations there for weather, but you know, in general, we're tracking along where we thought. However, if you look at that bottom one, our purchase power costs, actual versus forecast, aren't aren't really rising and falling the same way. They're tending to be lower than or right at our original forecast. And so that was when we made the adjustment at the end of the second quarter was we were doing better this year than than our original very conservative estimate on purchase power. And what we're seeing is is you know, we're holding steady with that for the third quarter. So again, you know, we're recommending leave the rates the same um, through the fourth quarter of this year, examine them again as we do quarterly. And also um, one of our items on the agenda today is uh, an actual outside consultant rate study. And so what we'd like to see, and we're hoping to see at the end of the fourth quarter, is maybe the ability to hold those rates even for one more quarter until January when we can actually complete um, that rate study and have some recommendations by the outside consultant. So right now we're looking good in that regard, and we'd like to recommend we just leave things where they are for now. Okay. And any other questions? Um, public comment. Mark Mutcher, 617 Indian Lilac Road. I'm, I'm glad the purchase power costs are holding. Uh, other people seem to be increasing their fuel charges, and but uh, at least ours are holding the same. So on a cash flow basis, it looks like 
we don't need to do anything rate-wise. My only concern would be um, uh, the capital costs, if they're sufficient, and um, the reason I say that is because in my business, I'm getting a lot of calls from people on the island south of Beachland uh, that are having a lot of outages and they cause problems with their electronics. Um, I don't know how to put that in perspective or if there are, you know, unbudgeted capital costs that are going to be needed to cure that situation or what. I just thought I'd call that to your attention. Right. We, we actually have, if you look at our 1415 proposed budget, um, we have a capital cost programmed in there for two of those substations on the island at around 500000 each. So the 1415 proposed capital budget, including a 1314 projected, includes us addressing th that issue. Yeah. Okay, but that... That couldn't or shouldn't be moved up, you know, to, to cure an immediate problem? Part, part of it is actually um, they're working on it now, and, and there's been some adjustment to the 13, 14 expenditures. Some things a little higher, some things a little lower, but they're doing the design, I believe, right now. Actually, there's an uh, item on the agenda for city council. Um, okay, so but that won't affect this analysis? <coughs> no. No, because okay. they're, 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 they're able to do it within, this shows the total transfer to capital um, for the year, and at this point they're able to do it within their total 13-14 budget by moving some things around, and then we program the rest of it for uh, October for 14-15. Right, but remember the 13-14 the budget is, what, $3 million and, and that last year went from 9 to 7 so we're already at... Uh, a drastically reduced capital level, and right, but for what it's worth. But but again, they've Ted's managed to fit what he's going to be able to get done. Because remember, we're in August. I mean, so there's only going to be a, a number of small number of expenditures through the end of the year, and, but they've started on them. And then there's enough in in the fourteen fifteen budget. So. Okay, um, then I'll make a motion that we uh, recommend City Council um, accept your report and keep the rates the same. Second. Second. All in favor or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, um, variance analysis, Cindy. Um, I think it's been a while since we've looked at this together. I know you've been receiving them, but we haven't talked about them. Um, however, it, you know, in the interest of brevity, because last meeting that we had together, I talked so much, what I'd like to do is just point out a couple of things to you, and then again, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have about the variance analysis. One of the things that we did when we went to quarterly financial statements was we, um, at least I had indicated that I was hoping to add um, some things that I thought were of value to the statements because I didn't have to do them, but quarterly to add some additional um, analysis and reports to just the statements regarding the individual line items. So if you got, I think you got a copy of this quarterly financial report either attached to your agenda or you have a hard copy. If you open it up, I want to point these things out to starting page eight. On page eight, what we've added is um, a report that shows the pooled cash and investments balance by fund. So in addition to the fund balances or the increases, decreases you see in the rest of the report, as of month end June, this is the actual pooled cash and short-term investments that the city had on hand, a um, little over $65 million. And of that, $27.3 million in the electric utility and 14.2 in the water sewer. The next thing that we added um, is on page 9, and what you see on 9 is a quarterly summary of the city's debt, um, and it's broken out again by the different funds. We've got the electric utility and the water and sewer broken out separately toward the middle of the page, and you can see the principal balance that we had at the beginning of the year, the number of principal payments or retirements that have taken place through June 30th, and then where the principal balance stands as of June 30th for each of the loans that the city has outstanding, as well as often this right-hand column, how much the interest expense has been for the year. This is important, I think, because as we've talked about before, the way we budget debt service is for principal and interest payments, but the way it shows up in our reports is interest only because it's an enterprise fund, and principal isn't an expense, it's a reduction of liability. 
So this helps you see where that the city is paying its loans and how much debt service expense really has taken place, both principal and interest, during the year in those enterprise funds. So we think that's kind of useful. And then finally, specifically for the electric utility, what you see on page 30 at the end of the section of the report that speaks to the electric utility is a consolidated <coughs> balance sheet for the electric utility that shows um, at a high level the assets, the liabilities, the net assets, and the total cash balance as well as the days of unrestricted cash on hand. And that's something that we've been monitoring fairly closely. What you'll notice for June 30th is that the days of unrestricted cash on hand are about 76 or about $15.8 million. We're shooting for 90. I will tell you that as of month end July, that's already improved by $1 million and is up over 80. And the reason it dipped low at the end of June is because, based on your recommendation and the Finance Commission's recommendation, we paid off a loan for $3.2 million in cash. So we sort of anticipated that in that, that quarter when we paid that off, we'd have this dip down a little bit because we gave up 3.2 in cash. But we do anticipate that by the end of the fiscal year, with it improving by a million already in July, that we'll be back up in that 90 to 95-day range where we need to be. So with that, um, that's some of the additions and improvements. We saw also added some, uh, we think, useful graphical representations of where we stand year to date on uh, revenues and expenses versus the pro rata amounts. And <coughs> I had this all week last week, Scott, so I know how you feel. <laughs> um, and uh, we have the variance analysis. Again, just as a reminder, since we haven't talked about this together in a while, our variance analysis is, um, in order to get an analysis, the line item has to meet two criteria. One, it has to be over or under 10% different than pro rata year to date. So for instance, year to date, three quarters, 75%. In order to make this variance analysis, something has to be bigger than 85 or smaller than 65. And the line item itself has to be greater than $70,000. Those were um, an agreement that we made with the Finance Commission that prevents us from doing variance analysis on you know, $400 line items that are kind of irrelevant in the scheme of things. So if it meets those two criteria, it makes it to the variance analysis. And the variance analysis for the enterprise funds, the utilities, begins on page two and um, continues through uh, water and sewer at the end of page, top of page seven. So I don't know if you've had a chance to review that. I could point out a couple. You know, Some of them are just built-in variances that happen all the time. For instance, the one we've talked about before, purchase power costs are always lagging behind because we don't pay for June purchase power until the third week of July. So they're, they're always out by one month. The one that's probably of interest uh, on page two is something we've talked about it's about $184,000 of loss on disposal of assets, and that's the book value loss for the sale of the fuel that was in the tanks. So we got cash, and that was good, but the value on the books of the gas that was in the tanks was greater than the cash that we got for it, and from an accounting standpoint, it shows up as a loss on the disposal of that asset. So that's where that came from, and um, isn't cash, but is reflected that way in the financial statements. Um, other than that, i um, happy to answer any questions you have about either the quarterly report or the variance analysis. Yeah, I notice we're having um, some overtime mm -hmm. in TND, um, and we're expecting some overtime in or more power over time with power resources. Um, and the, uh, would, you care, would you speak to those? Absolutely. The, the, the real issue with those is um, primarily turnover and vacancies. There's been a, a, a fair amount of that in T&D and, and in power resources both this year. And as those positions become vacant, you know, operational needs have to be met, which requires using people that are still here in an overtime capacity. If you look, um, some of the variances in overtime are offset, you know, 
pretty well by variances. For instance, at the bottom of page two, um, you're looking at 75% of the year, we're at only 48% of salaries in maintenance and 56% of operating salaries. Um, so it's a trade-off. And in total, we don't think we'll be over budget, but it's just a trade-off due to turnover and, and retirement. You're welcome. And then, Mr. Chairman, the last item that I have for you is one that we talked about um, at our last meeting, and this is the draft of an RFP for an electric utility rate study. The last time that we had a rate study done by an outside consultant was back in 2009. We had a um, consultant called Public Resources Management Group that prepared a rate study that included, you know, a five-year financial projection and five years of, you know, projected rates, et cetera. And that study led to the adoption of revised rates and a slightly revised rate structure back in January of 2010. Um, back in May, the council directed us to repair, prepare an RFP for this and for an optimization study. After Going back and forth about it a little bit, we concluded that it would be best to separate the two. They're really two different disciplines for one thing. And also, this RFP for the rate study is fairly straightforward and can be released with your comments and the Finance Commission's comments in late August. We could probably have it awarded sometime in October and be able to actually have the results of it. We're hoping um, 120 days or sometime in January and, and let that come to us in time to impact our rate making for uh, for next fiscal year, whereas the optimization study RFP is, f is fairly extensive and will take longer both to prepare and to award because um, it meets the requirements of CCNA and Florida statutes. So what you have is the draft. Um, this draft, you know, clearly was based on the one we did before, but we have added a few things. Um, and if you want, I'll walk you through a couple of, I think, the specific things that are important about this, and then we'll take any comments you might have. Um, let's focus on the scope. The rest of it's fairly boilerplate. Back in the scope on page, um, I believe it's 14 or 15, probably 14. This is where, oh, yeah, at the top of 14, under number four, development of operating expense projections and capital <coughs> funding requirements. As you recall from our discussion uh, about the SWOT analysis of the rate reduction ideas, we did say that we would have the consultant have a look at the city's practice of funding capital through uh, current year rates, and that's included um, here under item four, where we talk about having them review our five-year capital program, assist the city with developing appropriate capital funding strategies based on standard industry practices, and um, you know evaluate future debt service requirements, et cetera. So that's included in this RFP. So so that we'll have some uh, advice from an out outside consultant about what we're doing and whether it's the right thing to do. Under cost of service analysis at the bottom of that page, um, at the suggestion of our electric utility director, we're asking them really not just to look at our rate structure as it is now and tell us whether it's sufficient or not. We can do that ourselves. Uh, you know, We can project revenues based on our current rate structure and tell whether we're making enough money. We're asking them to look at our rate structure, our current customer demographics, and tell us if there are better or more um, modern or industry standard ways to approach the way we charge our customers, um, including you know, the fact that we've got one tier at 1,000 kilowatt hours, the energy cost almost doubles, and that's the only tier. You know, is that the right structure? Should there be multiple usage tiers? Um, for example, down here at the bottom, um, we've asked them to look at the cost effectiveness of time of day rates for large customers or billing credits for our ability to call on uh, customers with large generators to help with um, peak shaving. So we're really asking them to do more than rate sufficiency. We're asking them to really look at our structure and the design. The last place that I think is important on, is on page 16 under additional services. There's three things here. One, if this consultant is going to come and do a five-year forecast and a rate sufficiency, et cetera, what I'm asking is that then um, they stay with the city for the next five years and come back periodically and do exactly what I did for you today, which is update their forecast against actuals and help us make course corrections with regard to the rates that we should be charging to stay on track. So. 
That's the second bullet here, periodic updates to the five-year financial forecast based on actual revenues and expenses and ongoing monitoring of rate sufficiency. With the last one in, in 2010, when they were done, they were done and they walked away and it was sort of you know on us to, to figure out if we were staying on track. The, the last bullet there keeps them connected to the eventual optimization study, and that is for them to model the impact on the rates and the rate structure for various cost-saving initiatives that might be proposed as part of the optimization study. So again, they'll stay on contract with us once the optimization study is done. We can say to them, hey, we're going to do this, and it will save these kinds of costs. Tell us how that impacts the rates, and tell us how that impacts the rate structure. So those are the additional services we'll keep them on track for. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, Tom is here. Jim is here and um, take any comments that you might have about changes to this. It is our intention to put it in front of the City Council on the 19th to make sure that they have um, your feedback as well as the Finance Commission's and to release this um, as quickly as possible in August so we can get on with getting this awarded and getting it done. Okay. I got a question, and that is you mentioned that you've got people that have generator sets that they can put on. How much do we have in the city of that? We're not really sure of that because uh, we would have to take an inventory not only of that but also the solar panels <clears throat> that are available and to see what how that would impact. And the other thing we have to do is go back also to our OUC contract and see how we may have to modify that as well if we turn those on. Uh, there is a, uh, I think it was Leesburg that got into a little hot water because their contractual agreement for taking base load power, they started contracting with the hospital as an example and found out they were in violation of their contract. So we'll have to check with all of that. Hopefully this uh, view will help us in that process. But I don't think we have a total handle on what the uh, uh, reserves are that could be used. So you have, you have to work with OUC at the same time you're working with these people to see if it's even feasible. If that is correct. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mention that because it actually says in the RFP, for example, so we're, we're not only mentioning some things that we know that other utilities do, but we're actually asking the consultant, hey, what are we missing in, in our rate structure that other people do commonly now? Um, because the the adjustment to our rate structure in 2010 was pretty minimal. It just shifted, you know, some costs between the base and, and another rate. It didn't really look at the whole thing in terms of what customer demographics are now and, and what kinds of things utilities do to, to be cost efficient. So. And, and two, uh, two places that really sort of stand out, the hospital being probably yeah. the largest, Five could times. be real benefit to us. But here at City Hall, during our peak times, uh, and we have, as a matter of fact, we're going to be getting a generator that's larger and have more capacity, and it may be cheaper that way. Yeah, haven't done anything. But we do have the, that energy study doing but we do leave lights on. You're right. Well, Publix has generator sets, too. Yeah, right. You know, but at the end of the day, your rate structures, in, in a lot of ways, also are there to incentivize certain behaviors. And so that's really kind of the question we're asking. How do we structure this so that we can incentivize people to, you know, shave their peak or use different energy at different times or, you know, get off and, the peak loads? And some utilities do have uh, uh, peaking requirements for large homes as an example. So they they have expanded out into that area. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. On the question of incentivizing people, um, a number of utilities uh, credit their customers uh, on their meters if they generate solar power over and above their own needs. We do, we do that already. I'm sorry? We do that. We do that. We do that? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Uh, How many I now? remember I called the utility well, maybe a couple of years ago, and I was told you don't do that, but when? I guess that's relatively recent. I don't. I, yeah. I've only been here for three years, but, but we, we do that now. I don't know how recent that is. I can find out. Because we do have an array of souls around the city. No, I now, most of those don't generate more than what their consumption is and so there's really they get credit because they offset the consumption of our power yeah okay yeah. that's fine but i can find out for you when we started the net meters 
Yeah, thank you. And that'll be another thing we have to do is revise what our payback would be. For example, the hospital, if we use, if we were going to pay them for power being generated, how do we come up with a pay schedule that would benefit them to run their generation? But essentially, that's that's what we're looking for from the <coughs> consultant is come and tell us, you know, how our rate structure compares to what other people do. And what, what are your goals? And therefore, what are some of the things you can do with your rate structure that, that might help you achieve those goals? So. And would you look at um, other programs, uh, state or federal programs, that would encourage people to uh, get it more involved into ultimate uh, energy supply, solar, have you? Well, I think other than providing, um, providing some sort of credits for our usage for those kinds of things. I don't know that we would cross over into getting involved with the individual businesses or homeowners for, for actually putting in those kinds of changes. I mean, we go out now, and, and if someone has had an excess usage at their house, we go to their house and have a look and, and you know give them recommendations. But I don't know that we've included in this um, really getting involved in that conservation side of things. Is, is that becoming a significant portion of what, what would be our demand, or...? Wow. So it's still pretty small. I don't know. Tom, maybe Tom or Jim can answer that. I, I, I think it'd be relatively small, but as you all heard from OUC, one of our big charges is that capacity payment we have to make on an annual basis, and they set that based on what our consumption or what our purchases are from them. So if we can drive that number down, uh, it, it does save us some money. Is it going to be significant? I don't really have a handle on that yet. Uh, another question with regard to the contract itself. Um, I, speak in your oh, I can hear you, but <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I have a question about the contract itself. Um, is that going to be a fixed price contract, or is, um, I think what we've asked them for here splits? is um, is an all-inclusive price for the initial for the initial study and scope mm -hmm. of work, and then um, hourly rates. And um, let me just double check. And then anything add-on in the additional scope would be negotiated separately. So there'll be a price for the initial work, and then and the initial scope, and then anything added on would have to be negotiated. I see. Okay, so they wouldn't be doing the follow-up. Um, reviews that you uh, foresee on a f fixed basis, x so much per year to do. It, no, what what it says here in the is in the in the RFP is that the proposed fee should be the total all inclusive cost to perform the rate study in the scope of work in five one and five two, and then for the cost of additional services, consultants should provide an hourly rate and fee schedule. And then what we would do is, you know, based on their hourly rate, which will help us assess later on, um, if we really wanted them come and do it every quarter, we'd probably negotiate a, an annual price with them for quarterly updates. Mm -hmm. We're leaving the option open with the hourly rate schedule, but but our first task is give us an all-inclusive price, travel, meetings, the whole thing for that very initial study. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> public comment. Uh, Mark Nutcher again. Couple small comments. Uh, Cindy, you mentioned a, a net meter. I, is that something that if somebody has some generation capability and they think they might produce more than they use, you put a different meter in there that, that records negative values? Or how, do, how does that work? Are they physically different or is that just what we call them because they, they net out to the negative? I, I, am, I don't know the answer to that question unless Tom does. I don't know if they're actually a different kind of meter or whether it's just in the read. Normally it's a... Different meter, completely okay. different meter. Well, there you go. See her. Yeah, me. usually it's. A, I haven't actually looked at the installation. The net meter is the concept where uh, you know you net the ins and the outs together over the month, and the customer gets the net bill. Um, and I believe the metering arrangement generally involves either a special meter that, that reads both directions, or two meters with a, um, a kind of an arrangement that only allows one meter to run at a time, whether it's in or out. I actually haven't looked at the facilities here in Bureau. Yeah, I think he's. But it doesn't matter much. It's either way. It comes out the, yeah. the customer gets a net bill. Thank you. The other comment I wanted to make had to do with the fact that I'm 
led or led the rate structure. Cindy mentioned um, the thousand kilowatt hour threshold, but I would remind you that our, our residential rate structure parallels uh, Florida Power and Lights uh, pretty closely, so it's it's easy to compare other. Um, other municipalities, anyway, will sometimes have a, a flat residential rate structure, whether it's above or below a thousand, which is the way we used to do it, which is how we got to 58 percent over Florida Power and Light at, at a thousand. But um, so now we're we're kind of paralleling them. Um, uh, I. Trust they'll look at the equity between the residential and commercial. From what I'm hearing, uh, we do that pretty well. There are bad examples out there like Lake Worth, whereas they they kind of screw their commercial customers to artificially lower their residential customers. Um, their rate is not a dollar five or one hundred and five dollars like you hear in the funny papers. Um, the uh, FMEA uh, has, for the, at least the past eight months, um, forgotten their $10.50 customer charge. So it's $115.50, not $105. But even that rate, which is lower than ours, is artificially supported by their commercial rates, which are way higher than ours. So um, I'm just saying that it'd be good to to look at the equity uh, of all these things, and and I think that's what you're talking about in terms of rate structure, right? Okay, thank you. Actually, the artificial the the bump up is at 1,500 kilowatts. Our bump up is a thousand. Is it a thousand? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Which which you know is pretty low. And then above there, it's flat. And above there, it's, it, it bumps up only one time at 1,000. Well, you say that's our average, though. So. From 4610 to uh, 73 and some change, and then after that, it's flat. But, you know, again, the, if I understand correctly, FPNL, uh, their demand meter level is 20 uh, kW and not 30. FPNL, um, and ours is 30 for commercial customers. Uh, if I understand correctly, FPNL has residential demand meters. We do not. So, I mean, there are just so many different approaches. I think that's what you were alluding to. So there's so many different approaches to rate structures. And although, you know, we probably don't want to spend enough money for them to look at every single possibility, we, we want someone who knows what they're doing to look at this and say, hey, you know, there's some ways you can achieve your, your goals if your goals are lower rates, rate equity, and, and maybe a little more focus on conservation or at least on peak shaving, which will help us lower the costs from, from our purchase power providers. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do we have a, a motion to recommend a recommendation on the RFP? I make a motion we accept the RFP and send out. Okay. Any uh, formal discussion? Um, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. The, um, Membrane project. Did Rob think we were not going to get through the electrical stuff today? I think it's here. Maybe you just thought we. I was going to. Well, anyway. Time since I did last time, so. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you, Cindy. Jim, in that magazine I gave you, there is an article about membrane, reverse osmosis membranes, and doing some things that can make the membranes last longer. So you might look at that. Or give it to Rob. Uh, also give it to Rob. Yeah. I don't know where he is. He's around here somewhere. <laughs> Excuse me just a minute. Sing us a song, Scott. I was going to sing. Yeah. yeah, I was going to sing, but then <laughs> no. I decided against it. <laughs> Actually, I gave I gave Rob an article about a year ago about a different type of reverse osmosis one. I don't know any of you, any more of you get Pollution Magazine. I don't know why I get it. It has a lot of good articles about that.
Guess he thought we were going to be here longer. <laughs> the first part. I never heard it so quiet. Yeah. yeah. Well. <clears throat> Jane, can you give us a little background on reverse osmosis? <laughs> Some things that we might want to... <laughs> well, it, it um, is a treatment process that, that removes um, just about everything, including metals as precursors for the um, uh, disinfection byproducts production. And um, it... Uh, makes the water extremely aggressive, but it does remove the harmful particles. Then after you remove them with reverse osmosis, which also takes out salt, which is not normally done by most filtration types, like softeners and even uh, granulated carbon filtration will not take out salt. So you have to use reverse osmosis. And, um, th but this makes the water very ag aggressive. So when you're done, then you have to blend it back with some of the untreated water so that whenever you put it out into the, to the uh, distribution system, you won't eat everything. Now, we blend back, though, I understand, with treated water that we do from our lime softening. That's right. We use lime softening water okay. for this system, but not everybody does that. Nobody, not everybody has that ability. Some people have to Sorry use. about the delay, but he had caught up at his office. He's on his way. Okay. Should be Why don't you take a short break? Yeah, according, we... according to the article on that thing, what reverse osmosis does is it takes the H2O and, and forces it through. Anything that's attached to it gets left behind. So you end up with just water. Makes okay, well, with that, why don't we take a 10-minute uh, a break and give Rob an opportunity to get over here. And, okay. All right, so we'll, thank you.